On the very day of September 11, several commentators drew a parallel with the historical events of Pearl Harbor. And it's a day that will, as was the case with Pearl Harbor, live in infamy in American history. The last time there was an attack like this on the United States was Pearl Harbor. Reminiscent of another terrible day, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But there was also someone on the same day who offered a prediction. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, guess what we did? We went back and found out that yes, the evidence was there. We should have known. And again, I think what we're going to see, even in this instance, this Pearl Harbor of the 21st century is very much the same kind of thing. In fact, the more information that has been emerging about September 11, the more we have come to realize that many different aspects of the two events bear a chilling resemblance to each other. While both events were needed by the U.S. to go to war, in both cases the ultimate goal was not the one initially stated. Roosevelt knew a surprise Japanese attack would enrage the public and jumpstart the American war machine. In this way, FDR would get backdoor entry into what he really wanted. War with Hitler. According to their own documents, before 9-11, the neocons knew that a surprise attack, like a new Pearl Harbor, would enrage the public and jumpstart the war machine against Afghanistan. In this way, they would get a backdoor entry into what they really wanted, the war with Saddam Hussein. In the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person and that he needed to go. He says that going after Saddam Hussein was topic A 10 days after the inauguration, eight months before September 11th. Before and during the war, the propaganda machine made a relentless effort to create a direct connection between Hitler and Japan. One poll taken immediately after Pearl Harbor showed that more than 60% of Americans believed that Germany was behind the attack. The Bush-Cheney propaganda machine made an even harder effort to create a direct association between Iraq and Osama bin Laden. By the end of 2003, nearly 70% of Americans believed that Saddam was implicated in the September 11 attacks. Top levels of the Roosevelt administration knew in advance that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. General Marshall and Admiral Stark and indeed FDR indeed knew that Pearl Harbor was being painted for a bombing run by the Japanese. Secretary of State Cordell Hull even knew the exact day of the attack, a week before it took place. Cordell Hull was Secretary of State. And he called me on Saturday morning and he started to relate that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Before September 11, many in the intelligence community knew the attacks were on their way. There was so much discussion about this attack. Everybody was talking about it. George Tenet had some meetings. Other, other analysts had meetings at the White House. Vital information on the Japanese attack was kept from those who could have used it to defend the Hawaiian port and to minimize the number of American casualties. Two men could use that information immediately. Admiral Husband Kimmel and Lieutenant General Walter Short, the commanders at Pearl Harbor. But they never get it. According to Hill, that was no mistake. If FDR and his administration deliberately withheld the vital intelligence from Pearl Harbor, and all the evidence indicates that they did, then it was certainly a deliberate conspiracy to set Pearl Harbor up for a total defeat. Before September 11, important information was kept from counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, who could have organized a defense and even have prevented the attacks altogether. You have to intentionally stop it. You have to intervene and say, no, I don't want that report to go. We therefore conclude that there was a high-level decision in the CIA ordering people not to share that information. In both cases, the pre-knowledge by the U.S. government on the upcoming attacks was denounced in front of Congress. In September 1944, Republican Representative Forrest Harness of Indiana made the first congressional charge about a Pearl Harbor conspiracy. He said that three days before Pearl Harbor, the Australian government had warned Washington that a Japanese aircraft carrier was headed towards Hawaii. But, he said, that information was withheld from Kimmel and Short. 
After September 11, Republican Congressman Kurt Weldon denounced the pre-knowledge of information on the upcoming attacks, which was intentionally withheld from the intelligence community. This is an attempt to prevent the American people from knowing the facts about how we could have prevented 9-11, and people are covering it up today. When honest officials stumbled on important information on the Japanese attack, they went straight to their superiors, only to see that information ignored, diverted, or suppressed altogether. The Chief of Naval Intelligence in Washington, Captain Alan Kirk, recognized the message as plans for a bombing raid, but his persistent attempts to warn Kimmel ended when he was assigned to other duties. At Pearl Harbor, the Admiral had no way of knowing that Kirk had been repeatedly refused permission to warn him. In August 2001, FBI agent Colleen Rowley discovered information that could have led to uncover the September 11 plot. But her memos never got past her superiors, while she was prevented from pursuing the investigation any further. Finally, it turns out they were not read by the lawyer and the FBI who had the duty to send those over to the Department of Justice. Hours before the Japanese strike, Roosevelt's chief of staff, George Marshall, became suddenly unavailable, delaying the process of communication within the chain of command. General George Marshall, the man who should have acted, was nowhere to be found. Colonel Rufus Bratton was responsible for keeping Marshall supplied with such vital information. For Bratton, Marshall's sudden unavailability at a time when America was on the brink of war could not have been accidental. In the crucial hours of September 11, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and other top military became suddenly unavailable, hampering the decisional process within the chain of command. For 30 minutes, we couldn't find him. Withholding information, however, may not have been sufficient to guarantee the success of the Japanese attack. The military capacity of the Hawaiian port was also kept below its requirements. General Short, faced with the need to send out long-range patrols, had only a handful of suitable aircraft. His demands for more were not seen as a priority. On September 11, only four jets remained on alert to defend the entire sector of the country most likely to suffer an attack. I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. President Roosevelt gave direct orders not to interfere with the Japanese attack. President Roosevelt told the General Marshall to send a message to the Hawaiian and Philippine commanders, don't interfere with Japan's overt act of war. The United States desires that they, uh, Japan, commit the first overt act. There's no argument about what FDR meant. Uh, he meant that, uh, that the U.S. naval plan uh, to defend Pearl Harbor should not and cannot be executed. On September 11, Vice President Cheney gave a direct order regarding the plane headed towards Washington, which in fact resulted in the plane reaching its target without being shot down. Young man said, Mr. Vice President, the plane's 10 miles out. Um, do the orders still stand? And the Vice President sort of whipped his head around and said, of course they do. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 sailors killed at Pearl Harbor that President Roosevelt could finally enter a war the U.S. had been preparing for months in advance. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 victims of September 11 that President Bush could launch a war that had already been prepared in the smallest detail. CNN and Time Magazine have reported that on September 10, 2001, a military plan to attack Afghanistan had been placed on George Bush's desk to be signed by the President upon his return from Florida. May God grant us wisdom, and may he watch over the United States of America. Then came the official commissions, which in both cases were tasked to find out whether there had been a conspiracy by the same authorities that were suspected of having participated in the conspiracy. Just three months after VJ Day, Senator Alvin Barkley of Kentucky convenes the Joint Congressional Committee on the investigation of the Pearl Harbor attack. The committee lays much of the blame on the commanders at Pearl Harbor and largely exonerates FDR and his top advisors. But its conclusions draw charges of cover-up and cronyism. 
gross negligence becomes high treason when the motive is discovered or understood. In July 2004, the Commission published its final report. Two and a half million pages of documents. We've interviewed over 1,200 individuals, including experts and officials, past and present. However, the Commission report failed to meet many of the family's expectations and concluded that 9-11 was merely a failure of imagination. Published in 2004, the 9-11 Commission Report has become the central focus of criticism by the 9-11 Truth Movement, a movement comprised of thousands of individuals and associations from all over the world, all connected through the Internet. The Commission's report is accused of having simply rubber-stamped the government's version of the events by ignoring all the evidence against it, while covering up its most conspicuous holes with a long series of omissions, distortions, and even plain falsehoods. Led by researcher David Ray Griffin, an international panel of 20 experts on 9-11 has compiled a list of the strongest evidence against the official version that has emerged to this day. This evidence is available to the public on their website in four different languages. Despite all the evidence that has emerged in the last decades, there are many who still reject the idea of a conspiracy at Pearl Harbor and prefer to reassert the much more simplistic explanation called the official version. There was no conspiracy. FDR did not know. Uh, Cordell Hull did not know. The American government did not know that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. It was a what has uh, been called a failure of imagination. Despite all the evidence presented in the last 10 years by the 9-11 Truth Movement, there are many who openly support the official version by the government and dismiss such evidence as irrelevant. These people are known as debunkers, as their stated intent is to debunk the evidence presented by the 9-11 Truth Movement against the official version. The most authoritative debunker in Italy is Paolo Attivissimo, a member of an organization called CICAP, which has openly declared war on the so-called conspiracy theorists. Attivissimo has held numerous conferences on 9-11, in which he has covered all the most important aspects of the debate. The most prominent champion for the official version in France is Jerome Quirant, who also wrote a book called September 11 and the Conspiracy Theories. Quirant also participated in numerous conferences and television debates on 9-11 in his own country. But the flagship for the debunkers worldwide is certainly the American magazine Popular Mechanics. In 2006, they published a book called Debunking 9-11 Myths, in which the authors purport to have refuted all the major claims against the official version by the 9-11 Truth Movement. Jim Miggs is the editor of Popular Mechanics magazine. In 2005, he and a staff of reporters decided to take on the factual and scientific claims made by members of the 9-11 conspiracy movement. The results were first published in a magazine article, then more fully developed in a book titled Debunking 9-11 Myths, Why Conspiracy Theories Can't Stand Up to the Facts. I think what Popular Mechanics did with the 9-11 Conspiracy Theory was just about one of the best things ever done in the history of skepticism. That is exactly how it should be done. Here's the claim, here's the answer. Here's the claim, here's the answer. By the end, they got nothing to stand on. Boom, end of story. But is it really so? The debate on September 11 can roughly be divided into these areas of discussion. We have the four hijackings as the overarching event of the day, and we have the three different locations that were hit by the four airplanes. One of them hit the Pentagon, another crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the other two hit the Twin Towers in New York. The debate on the hijackings is divided in three parts. The first one focuses on the air defense, and whether the failure to intercept the hijacked airplanes was accidental or intentional. The second focuses on the hijackers, and whether they were actually aboard the airplanes or just the usual patsies. The third part focuses on the aircraft themselves, and whether the four airplanes used in the attacks were the same ones that took off from the airports that morning, or were something that only resembled them from the outside. What initially raised suspicions on the true role of the military on September 11 is the fact that the U.S. air defense, which is arguably the most advanced and sophisticated in the world, was unable to intercept even one of the four hijacked airplanes in the course of over one and a half hours. I remember thinking, where on earth are the interceptors? I'm an old interceptor pilot, and it's absolutely 
unbelievable that hijacked airliners could fly around for an hour and 40 minutes without being intercepted. Uh, as a former Minister of National Defense, why did airplanes fly around for an hour and a half without interceptors being uh, scrambled? Take them uh, you know, with a quick reaction alert, they should have been in the air in five minutes or ten minutes. If not, as a Minister of National Defense, uh, would, I would want to say, why not? This astonishing failure to respond was remarked by Senator Mark Dayton in the post-9-11 congressional hearings. But what I find much more shocking and alarming were the repeated and catastrophic failures of the leaders in charge and the other people responsible to do their jobs, to follow established procedures, to follow direct orders from civilian and military commanders. The official justification for this failure is a series of blunders, miscommunications, and mistakes that has come to be known as the incompetence theory. On that day, you saw a lot of well-meaning, confused people struggling to make sense of a, of a terrible situation. They didn't even know where the planes were. One argument for the incompetence theory is that the air defense was conceived to protect the U.S. from external threats, not internal ones. The fact is that our, our air defenses, uh, the whole NORAD system, was not at all geared towards protecting us from domestic aircraft. Quite the contrary. It was all set up to detect aircraft coming in from overseas. La difesa era predisposta per difendersi da attacchi provenienti dall'esterno. L'America era come se fosse una, un castello con un fossato, ma questi hanno usato una catapulta per entrare, saltando il fossato, si sono trovati all'interno, nel ventre mole dell'America, e l'hanno potuta ascoltare. What the debunkers forget to mention is that the responsibility for tracking internal hijacks has never fallen on the military to begin with. This has always been the duty of the Civil Air Traffic Controllers, the FAA, as explained by the Secretary of Defense himself. So the Department of Defense was oriented externally. Our radars were pointing out, not in, and the FAA was the one that, that then had the responsibility to say there's a hijack. Only then, explains author and researcher Nafiz Ahmed, is the military requested for assistance in scrambling their jets. Standard operating procedures dictate that as soon as a plane flies off course, the FAA will contact the plane and try to ask them what is going on. If there is a problem or if they cannot establish radio contact, then immediately the FAA will contact the Pentagon, who will, within a matter of minutes, a maximum of 10 minutes normally, will scramble fighter jets to intercept the civilian plane and to analyze the situation and see what is going on. The FAA authority over the national airspace is clearly acknowledged in this exchange between the military from September 11. If you can, hand the fighters over directly to FAA so they they're still under FAA control. We're okay. never going to take them. Just work with them, coordinate with them as best that you can with that. Take them to the area and let them uh, handle that airspace. Another argument for the incompetence theory is that by turning off the transponders, the hijackers had made the airplanes very difficult to be tracked on radar. That can't be overstated. The fact that once the hijackers turned off the transponders, uh, you had air traffic control who were looking at something like 4,500 primary radar blips. They were trying to pick out the plane that they just lost. Non sapevano dove andare perché i terroristi hanno disattivato un dispositivo che si chiama transponder che localizza l'aeroplano. Spento quello, puff, sparisce il puntino. E dov'è? Non si sa dove è. This is not true. When the transponder is turned off, the controllers lose the information on the altitude, but they can still track the plane as a primary signal. The following example shows how long it took an air traffic controller to find American 11 on his screen after he was told the plane had been hijacked. Uh, good morning, uh, Boston. I got a situation here with American 11. We believe it's a uh, possible hijack. Okay, tell me more. Uh, we lost radio communications with him. Then we lost uh, his transponder. And right now the uh, aircraft is just west of Albany going southbound. Okay, I see him. United 175 never turned the transponder off. It just switched codes. United 175 is 50 miles northwest of New York City when its transponder code is suddenly changed. As I look up, I notice that United 175's code has changed. I just turned around and radioed the pilot. My exact words were, United 175, recycle transponder squawk. Hijacker Al Shahi obviously intended to turn off that uh, transponder, but because he just changed codes and didn't turn it off, he still left the controllers with a very clear indication of the normal return from an aircraft that was squawking, that's what we call it, with the altitude. 
According to the Secret Service, the plane that hit the Pentagon was tracked for at least 30 minutes before it reached Washington. Nelson Garabito was the Secret Service agent in charge of protecting the White House airspace. First thing I did is I picked up the phone to call my, my contact, the FAA. He said, we have four planes outstanding. Uh, two have hit the towers and two are headed to Washington, D.C. One of them approximately 30 minutes out, one of them approximately 45 minutes out. The one 30 minutes out turned out to be the plane that hit the Pentagon. As the one nearest us got closer and closer, six minutes out, five minutes out. We knew it was sort of over the CIA and we thought, is that where it's going? Um, but it, it kept coming. United 93 was also being tracked after the hijacking. We were tracking United 93 and I was in conversation with the FBI agent and he was relaying to me that we suspect that this aircraft has uh, now been taken over by hostile forces, described the sharp turn it made over uh, eastern Ohio and now is heading back uh, along southwestern Pennsylvania. The airplane was being followed step by step, practically in real time. He's, uh, right now he is west of Johnstown still. 12 miles. At some point, it even turned the transponder back on, showing not only its position, but also the altitude. It looks like he's still turning. Hey, his transponder just came back on and it was showing 8,000 feet, 200. 8,200 feet. 8,200 feet, he's on the same code that he was before. Save for some moments of confusion, the four airplanes were being tracked by air traffic controllers all along. The real reason for the failure to intercept the four aircraft seems to have been the high number of military exercises that were being run by NORAD on September 11 out of their base in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado. As Webster Tarpley noted in his book 9-11 Synthetic Terror, staff exercises or command exercises are perfect for a rogue network which is forced to conduct its operations using the same communications and computer systems used by other officers who are not necessarily party to the illegal operation. Interestingly enough, on the evening of September 10th, the security level for the NORAD computer system called Infocon had been dropped to normal, the lowest level. This made it easier for anyone to penetrate or compromise the computer networks of the air defense system. On September 11, between 4 and 10 military exercises had been scheduled, some of them involving false hijacks of commercial airplanes. This unusual number of exercises had two major consequences. One, they moved a large number of fighters out to Canada and Alaska. Two, they created a major confusion in the system as soon as the real hijackings were reported. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. The process of authorization for scrambles was lengthy and complicated. Hey, uh, we just, I just talked to Otis here, and they said they needed a NIAS authorization. Confusion and pressure kept mounting. I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination. At times, communications were jammed. If you could do me a favor and have them call us, we cannot call out for some reason. Some in the military quickly realized the simulations were causing a problem. You know what? Get rid of this goddamn sim. Hey, turn the sim switches off. Just get rid of that crap. I hope they cancel the exercise because this is ridiculous. But they were not canceled. Even after both towers in New York had been hit, when everyone knew America was under attack, the war games continued. You guys watching the news? Yeah. yeah I wasn't sure. I've been watching it for about 10 minutes. Did they suspend the exercise? Uh, not at this time, no. Apparently, someone took advantage of the situation. While the plane headed for the Pentagon was quickly approaching from the west, an unknown source, which was never identified, reported that American 11 was headed towards the capital even though the plane had already crashed into the North Tower. I just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and it's heading towards Washington. Okay, American 11 is still in the air? This attracted all the attention towards the so-called Phantom Plane. He's still airborne, he's still a hijack out there, but we can't get a position on him. The jets from Langley were prepared to intercept it. I don't know if they might want to alert some aircraft down there, though, too. We have Langley on battle stations right now. Okay. Then they were scrambled straight for Washington. Foxy, scramble Langley, head towards the Washington area. Roger that. But a different command post, called Giant Killer, sent the fighters out to the ocean. Say again where you want them. Uh, we want them in the Whiskey 386 area. This didn't sit well with the operations center. American Giant Killer and their wisdom sent them out over the water when we scrambled them to Washington. By the time the plane headed for the Pentagon was circling the capital, it was too late for the Langley jets to intercept it. 
Even after the Pentagon was hit, the war games were not suspended. And again, while United 93 was being hijacked, another false alarm attracted the attention in the opposite direction. Uh, did you get the word? I got a Delta 8-9er, south-southeast of Toledo. Delta 8-9, that's a hijack. They think it's possible hijack. Fuck. South of Cleveland, we have a code on it now. Good, pick it up, find it. Fuck, another one. Major Nazipani turned to Toledo Air Force Base. I'm sorry to be so uh, brief and quick on this, but uh, there's another possible hijack to about 50 miles east of Toledo, and you guys are the closest, and we need it somebody airborne. But instead of getting help, his authority was questioned. What authority is this coming from? Uh, what a, sir, what authority is this coming from? Uh, yeah. uh, the DO is the best I can tell you. Nazipani vented his frustration to his superior, Colonel Marr. He's going to tell his commander, the commander's going to call you because he doesn't believe the authority. Then they tried Duluth Air Force Base. What about yeah. Duluth? Okay. Duluth, you got no fighters. Nazipani went all the way to the Western Quadrant looking for help. This is Major Cheney. Who is this? Hey, Cheney. This is Nasty. How you doing? Hey, doing all right. Hey, we're not doing so good right now. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, possibly steal some aircraft out of Fargo from you guys. But here, too, there were no planes ready for scramble. They tried Syracuse, but 20 minutes was the best they could do. Syracuse 2 airborne in 20 minutes. They tried Alpina, but the planes were just returning from their training. The Alpina thing isn't what we thought. There's four guys coming home from the range right now. They started looking for planes that were already up in the air for exercises. So, anybody in training, send them home. He's moving the missions of Falcon, send them home. But those planes were spent at that point. They got no weapons. Here. They just going on a straight run up to the range. They blew out the road. By the time refueled and armed jets were finally scrambled, the Delta flight turned out to be another false alarm. He was a hijacked aircraft. He is not a hijacked aircraft. He's taking precautionary measures and he's landing at Cleveland Center. Only after the Delta flight had landed were the war games finally suspended. Well, so this is our Captain Paris on China. Yes. Uh, what we need you to do right now is to terminate all exercise inputs coming into China Mountain. By then, also the fourth hijacked airplane had been turned into a pile of smoking rubble. Yet General Myers, who was the highest military authority on September 11, has denied that the war games affected the military capacity of response. And the question was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. Uh, the answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. General Myers forgot to mention that on the morning of September 11, only four planes were armed and ready to intercept terrorists in the eastern region of the country. I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. That was the sensation of frustration, of... I don't have the forces available to do anything about this. Myers instead has even suggested that the war games helped the military response. Uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe he told him that it enhanced our ability to respond. What that means is that all the battle positions that uh, are normally not filled are indeed filled. So it was an easy transition from an exercise into a real-world situation. Actually, Again, Myers forgot to mention that the transition took place only after all tragic events had ended around 11 o'clock. By 11 o'clock, the sense of alarm had spread across the country. Fighter jets actually patrolling the skies. It was a war zone. Our skies were turned into a war zone. Everywhere you turn, it was military jets and helicopters everywhere. George Bush returned to Washington on the evening of September 11. The president finally returns to Washington. An escort of six helicopters was waiting for him. 300 fighters were defending the skies. Had there been 300 fighters ready to defend the skies on the morning of September 11, would the terrorist attacks have turned out the same way? This leads us straight into a pivotal question. Was the choice of scheduling so many exercises in the same day just a misfortunate call, or was it intentional? To answer this question, we need to take a closer look at some of the warnings the U.S. had received in the months prior to September 11. By the spring of 2001, the system was blinking red, according to intelligence chiefs. The U.S. administration has always maintained that they knew the attacks were on their way, but they didn't have specific information on them. I knew there was another attack planning. I knew there was another attack coming. Uh, and, and the obvious question behind that is, well, why didn't you do something about it? 
We had no specific information. It was not specific as to time, nor place, nor manner of attack. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, uh, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of that would indicate this type of operation in the country. All these statements are false. A joint congressional inquiry on September 11 has revealed that in spring and summer of 2001, there had been a flood of warnings about possible terrorist attacks in the United States, some using airplanes as weapons. In fact, as reported by the New York Times, American aviation officials were warned as early as 1998 that Al-Qaeda could seek to hijack a commercial jet and slam it into a U.S. landmark. The London Times has revealed that the British MI6 had warned the American intelligence services about a plot to hijack aircraft and crash them into buildings two years before the September 11 attacks. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said publicly that he ordered his intelligence agencies to alert the United States last summer in 2001 that suicide pilots were training for attacks on U.S. targets. German intelligence alerted the CIA in June 2001 that Middle Eastern terrorists were training for hijackings. The Sunday Herald has confirmed that Britain gave President Bush a categorical warning to expect multiple airline hijackings one month before the September 11 attacks. Then there was the infamous August 6th memo. President Bush was told in August that Osama bin Laden might be planning an attack involving the hijacking of U.S. aircraft. It's titled Bin Laden determined to strike in U.S. The two-page memo states, FBI information indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks. Maybe it's no coincidence that the FBI advised their own boss to stop flying commercial airliners as early as six weeks before 9-11. Why is the Attorney General of the United States doing all his air travel by specially chartered jet? The Justice Department cited what it called a threat assessment by the FBI and said Ashcroft has been advised to travel only by private jet for the remainder of his term. At this point, we can pose the following question. Knowing that the attacks were imminent, knowing that they might involve hijacked airliners, but not knowing where and when they could happen, would have been a good reason to beef up the defense and keep even more jets than usual on alert all across the country. Why instead schedule so many exercises in one day while leaving only four jets on alert to defend the very sector of the country that was most likely to be attacked? To bring even more confusion into the situation was a series of last-minute replacements and unexplained absences within the chain of command. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was General Henry Shelton, but on September 11 he was absent, and his post was taken by his deputy, General Richard B. Myers. The FAA's National Operations Manager was Ben Sliney. On the morning of September 11, Sliney had been on that job for less than one day. The protocols required for Mr. Sliney to speak directly with the hijack coordinator, Lieutenant General Mike Canavan. But Canavan on that day was in Puerto Rico, and apparently he had forgotten to designate a replacement. In regards to the ensuing confusion, Mr. Sliney has stated, That's incredible. There is only one person. There must be someone designated or someone who will assume the responsibility of issuing an order. At the head of the National Command Center was General Montague Winfield. But on the evening of September 10th, Winfield instructed Captain Charles Leidig to take his place on the following morning. Leidig had been just recently certified for that post and was also on his first day on the job. At the Operation Command of NEADS was Colonel Marr. When Marr called his superior, General Arnold, to get authorization to scramble the jets from Otis, he was told that Arnold was in a meeting where he could not be reached by telephone. Marr had to physically send a messenger looking for him. Precious minutes were lost as Marr waited for Arnold to return his call, and when the fighters were finally scrambled, it was too late for them to intercept American 11. The top commander in charge of NORAD was General Ralph Eberhard, who was stationed at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. Eberhard told the 9-11 Commission that he was made aware of the first hijacking practically at the same time American 11 slammed into the North Tower. He then went to his office and saw the CNN broadcast of the World Trade Center explosion. After the second impact, writes the commission, it was obvious to Eberhard that there was an ongoing and coordinated terrorist attack. At that point, Eberhard called General Myers to update him on the situation. 
But even though both generals knew the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes, neither of them suggested suspending the war games and recalling all the fighters available as soon as possible. Furthermore, instead of getting on the phone and taking control of the situation, in the most crucial moment of the day, General Eberhardt chose to get in his car and drive from the Peterson base to Cheyenne Mountain. The 30-minute drive put him completely out of the loop, since Eberhard couldn't receive telephone calls, wrote the Denver Post, as senior officials weighed how to respond. General Eberhardt was also the person responsible for lowering the security level of the defense computer system on the evening of September 10th. And then there was Donald Rumsfeld. As stated by the 9-11 Commission, procedures called for the hijack coordinator on duty to contact the National Military Command Center and to ask for a military escort aircraft to follow the flight. The NMCC would then seek approval from the Office of the Secretary of Defense to provide military assistance. If approval was given, the order would be transmitted down NORAD's chain of command. But this kind of procedure becomes difficult to follow when the hijack coordinator is in Puerto Rico. No one knows who the replacement is. The military command is in the hands of a total rookie, and the Secretary of Defense is nowhere to be found. Donald Rumsfeld told CNN that he was informed of the Trade Center being hit some 15 minutes before the Pentagon was hit. This places the episode around 9.22 in the morning. And after the Pentagon was hit, rather than go to the command center and take charge of the situation, the Secretary of Defense chose to lend a helping hand on the Pentagon's lawn. It's almost as if Rumsfeld didn't feel the need to be informed about what was happening to his country under attack. The Secretary of Defense is outside the burning building, while inside the Pentagon. For 30 minutes, we couldn't find him. Uh, and just as we began to worry, he walked into the door of the National Military Command Center. By the time Rumsfeld walked into that door, all major events had ended. In fact, Rumsfeld told the 9-11 Commission that he was just gaining situational awareness when he spoke with the Vice President at 10.39. That's more than one and a half hours after the whole world knew that America was under attack. Why would so many rookies be placed in key positions? And why would so many top officials be either absent or unavailable on a day when so many exercises were scheduled is a question that remains to be answered. Question. After having realized that the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes at 9.03, why didn't Eberhard immediately suspend all the war games and recall all the available jets to their bases? Why didn't Myers order him to do so after having been briefed by Eberhard on the ongoing attack? And why hasn't the 9-11 Commission ever asked either general these most fundamental questions? The final argument against the incompetence theory is offered by researcher Nafiz Ahmed. If we try to explain it by using the incompetence theory, it doesn't make sense. For example, if, if it was incompetence, we would expect that there would have been a normal inquiry into what went wrong. We would have expected that there would be some kind of reprimands, that certain officials would be um, downgraded or they would lose their jobs or something would have happened to correct the situation. But we find that there has been no such reprimands at all. Not only that didn't happen, but the opposite took place. After 9-11, most of the high-ranking people involved in this catastrophic failure were either confirmed to their posts or promoted to higher levels. Condoleezza Rice, who had misrepresented the information the government had on the attacks in a sworn testimony, kept her post as National Security Advisor and went on to become Secretary of State in the following Bush administration. General Eberhard, the NORAD commander who didn't think of recalling the war games as soon as he knew his country was under attack, was chosen to lead the newly created U.S. Northern Command, which the Department of Defense has termed the nation's premier military homeland defense organization. Donald Rumsfeld, who acted more like an estranged passerby than the Secretary of Defense, kept his post at the Pentagon and began enjoying the largest increase in military spending after the Vietnam War. Richard B. Myers, despite the total breakdown under his leadership, was promoted to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest military post in the country. On September 13, confirmation hearings were held for General Myers, as if nothing ever happened, while people were still being pulled alive from the rubble at Ground Zero. While at the Pentagon, the military appeared completely aloof from the events unfolding. At the White House, the coordination activity seemed to be concentrating under the firm authority of Vice President Cheney. In fact, the so-called NORAD tapes have revealed that the White House had ground-to-air missiles of their own. Hello there, 
Air Washington approach. All right. Make sure that the center does not have anything above our airspace also. The Secret Service is going to start shooting at anything in the air. Yeah, I just got a call from Washington. They said that uh, if there's anything above their airspace, the Secret Service is going to uh, free fire. This exchange, which took place around 10 a.m., sheds a whole new light on one of the most controversial issues of 9-11. The sworn testimony by Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta to the 9-11 Commission on May 2003. Mineta was being questioned about the events that took place in the PIOC, the underground bunker in the White House, from where Dick Cheney took charge of the situation after convincing President Bush to stay away from Washington for safety reasons. To fully understand the implications of this case, two things must be kept in mind. One is that according to the official version, Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37, while Flight United 93 crashed in Pennsylvania at 10.03. It's on this 26-minute window that hinges the whole credibility of the Vice President on his true role in the September 11 attacks. The second thing to keep in mind is that the order to shoot down civilian airliners came from the President through the Vice President only after the Pentagon had been hit. When the third plane hit the Pentagon, the magnitude of the attacks uh, grew dramatically. We didn't know if there were other planes that had been hijacked. So the first decision I made on Air Force One was to give our Air Force orders to shoot down commercial aircraft did, that did not respond. This means that any order given before the Pentagon was hit could not have been a shoot-down order. However, as Chairman Hamilton was inquiring about the shoot-down order, something unexpected emerged from Mineta on the plane that hit the Pentagon. And uh, we had that order given, I think it was by the President, that uh, authorized uh, the shooting down of commercial aircraft that were suspected to be controlled by terrorists. Um, were you there when that order was given? No, I, I was not. I was made aware of it uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Well, at the time, I didn't know what all that meant, and... Um, the flight you're referring to is the... The one flight that came into the Pentagon. Pentagon. Yeah. Mineta's deposition posed a major problem. Since the shoot-down order was given only after the Pentagon was hit, Cheney's order sounded very much like one not to shoot down the plane. Hamilton immediately suggested that what Mineta had witnessed was also a shoot-down order. Let me see if I understand. The plane that was headed toward the Pentagon and was uh, some miles away, there, there was an order to shoot that plane down. Well, I don't know that specifically. Commissioner Romer picked up where Hamilton left off. You said, uh, if I understood you correctly, that you were not in the room when the decision was made to what you inferred was a decision made to attempt to shoot down Flight 77 before it crashed into the Pentagon. Is that correct? I didn't know about the shooting, the order to shoot down. Commissioner Romer then tried to suggest a different solution. Was there another line of communication between the vice president and you said you saw Mr. Richard Clark on your way in? Was Clark running an operations center as well uh, on that day? Dick uh, was in the situation room. So there was a situation room making decisions about what was going to happen on well, shoot downs they as were well making, as the PIOC? I don't believe they were making any decisions. I think they were more information gathering from uh, various agencies. Could it have been in the situation room where somebody in the situation room recommended the shoot down and the vice president agreed to that? Commissioner Romer, I would assume that a decision of that nature would have been, would have had to be made at a much higher level than the people who were in the situation room. 
Unable to resolve the discrepancy, the 9-11 Commission took a series of dramatic steps. Firstly, they simply excluded Mineta's testimony from the final report. In the 560 pages of the report, Norman Mineta is mentioned only once, in an unrelated circumstance. His presence in the PIOC is never even acknowledged, and the video segment you have just seen has been removed from the Commission's official website, and it's no longer available. Secondly, the 9-11 Commission moved Dick Cheney's arrival in the PIOC to after the Pentagon had been hit. From the final report we read, the Vice President entered the underground tunnel leading to the shelter at 9.37, which is the same time the Pentagon was hit. The Commission stated that Dick Cheney remained in the tunnel for more than 20 minutes trying to complete a call to the President and that he only entered the PIOC at 9.58. Why would the Vice President spend more than 20 minutes in a tunnel trying to make a phone call when the PIOC is fully equipped with all kinds of telephones has never been explained. As a third step, the Commission moved the exchange with the young man to after 10 o'clock and rewrote it in order to reconcile it with the official version. From the final report we read, at some time between 10.10 and 10.15, a military aide told the Vice President and others that the aircraft was 80 miles out. Vice President Cheney was asked for authority to engage the aircraft. The military aide returned a few minutes later and said the aircraft was 60 miles out. He again asked for authorization to engage. The Vice President again said yes. In summary, the window of time Mineta described as during the time of the plane coming into the Pentagon had become 1010 to 1015 in the Commission report. The 50 miles out reference by Mineta had become 80 and 60 miles out in the report. The 30 miles out and 10 miles out mentions by Mineta were removed, and the unspecified order by Dick Cheney to the young man had become a straightforward shoot-down order. And now that the episode had been moved to after 10 o'clock, the Commission could maintain that the exchange Mineta had witnessed was referring to Flight 93 when the shoot-down order was already in place, and not to the flight that hit the Pentagon. There was only one problem with this version of the events. Norman Mineta had to be terribly confused in his recollections, as he could not have been with the Vice President in the PIOC at the time the Pentagon was hit. To support this theory, the debunkers point at a statement by Mineta who said he arrived at the White House while it was being evacuated. Since the official order of the evacuation came at 9.45, contend the debunkers, Mineta could not have been with the Vice President in the PIOC at the time the Pentagon was hit. But in the same deposition, Mineta also stated that he arrived at the PIOC at about 9.20 a.m. So it's presumable that he was referring to the people that had already started leaving the White House before the official order of evacuation was given. In fact, at 9.52, CNN reported that a slow evacuation of the White House had started some 30 minutes earlier, much before the official order was given. Furthermore, a Secret Service timeline compiled by the 9-11 Commission staff shows that the 30 miles out and 10 miles out calls came at 9.31 and 9.34 respectively. This clearly places the exchange Mineta witnessed before 9.37. At the same time, the main problem with placing Cheney's removal from his office at 9.37 is Dick Cheney himself. On September 16, five days after the events, Cheney stated on Meet the Press that he was taken into the bunker shortly after the second tower was hit, which happened at 9.03. So we turned on the television and watched for a few minutes and then actually saw the second plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. I talked to the president while I was uh, there over the next several minutes watching developments on the television and as we started to get organized to, uh, to figure out what to do, my uh, Secret Service agents came in and uh, they uh, hoisted me up and moved me very rapidly down the hallway, down some stairs, through some doors, and down some more stairs into an underground facility. And uh, they did that because uh, they'd received a report that an airplane was headed for the White House. There are also several highly credible testimonies that place Dick Cheney's removal from his office shortly after 9.03. ABC News quoted White House photographer David Borer saying that just after 9 a.m., Vice President Dick Cheney was in his West Wing office when two or three agents came in and told him, Sir, you have to come with us. Agents came inside the office and said, uh, Sir, you have to come with us. The New York Times reported the same story. 
At 9.03 a.m., as Vice President Cheney was staring at the TV screen, the second hijacked airliner exploded against the Twin Towers. At that moment, the Secret Service grabbed him and hurried him down to Piak. Richard Clark, in his book Against All Enemies, wrote that soon after the second tower was hit, Cheney began to gather up his papers. As I left, I counted eight Secret Service agents ready to move to the Piak. President Bush's secretary, Ashley Estes, stated, As the second plane hit, it didn't really click exactly what happened. Then I heard a noise, like a body bumping a door. I looked out into a hallway and saw the vice president with the Secret Service. They had kind of lifted him up and were running with him. At that point, it definitely registered what it was. Former Under Secretary of Defense Eric Edelman testified, I was already down in the Piak with the vice president when we got word there had been an explosion at the Pentagon. And, even after 10 years, Dick Cheney has not changed his story one bit. As we watched, we saw the second plane strike, and uh, then we knew it was, was a terrorist attack. Then uh, my Secret Service agent, lead agent, came bursting through the door of my office and uh, said, Sir, we have to leave now. While all these testimonies clearly placed Dick Cheney in the PIOC by the time the Pentagon was hit, the 9-11 Commission has admitted that the 9.37 entry time by Dick Cheney in the tunnel was based on alarm data which is no longer retrievable. And, most important of all, Mineta himself recalls being with the Vice President by the time the Pentagon was hit. So then someone came in and said, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President, the, uh, there's been an explosion at the, at the uh, Pentagon. In the course of time, Secretary Mineta has never changed his story, repeatedly confirming both the location and the timing of the event. And then all of a sudden, as I was talking to him, he said, uh, Oh, I lost the uh, bogey, lost the target. I said, well, where is it? He said, well, somewhere between Roslyn and uh, National Airport. And about that time, someone broke into the conversation. I said, Mr. Secretary, we just had a confirmation from an Arlington County police officer saying that he saw a, an American Airlines plane go into the Pentagon. That the exchange Mineta witness was referring to the plane that hit the Pentagon should be beyond doubt at this point. But we still don't know what was the order given by Dick Cheney to the young military, whose name turned out to be Douglas Cochran. In 2010, some researchers tracked down Mr. Cochran and asked him to clarify what the orders by Dick Cheney were. Mr. Cochran confirmed being the person involved in the exchange, but declined to elaborate. He simply stated that, Everything that happened on that day has been well documented. The 9-11 Commission report is the authoritative narrative on the events of 9-11. I have nothing to add. In fact, it turns out that in 2004, the 9-11 Commission did interview Douglas Cochran, military aide to the Vice President, on the inbound aircraft and on the shoot-down language used. But his interview has been withdrawn from public access, and to this day, it remains classified. While we wait for that document to be declassified, we can piece together the information we already have. 1. The sky over Washington is Class Bravo, restricted airspace. It's called Prohibited Area 56. In order to enter it, an airplane must have clearance from air traffic controllers, active two-way radio communications, and its transponder must be on. Otherwise, it's to be considered hostile and it could be shot down. 2. As explained by former Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, in a time of crisis, the Washington airspace goes into an actual lockdown. You would do what, what is being done, and that is closing off the entire airspace so that, you, in, in effect, the whole Washington area is a no-fly zone, so that any planes that are, can't identify themselves and get into that uh, are uh, to be shot down. Three, the White House had ground-to-air missiles of their own. Hello there, Washington approach. Hi. Make sure that the center does not have anything above our airspace also. The Secret Service is going to start shooting at anything in the air. Four. As the unknown airplane was approaching the protected airspace, it had no clearance from air traffic controllers, no radio communications active, and the transponder was off. He said, we're tracking an airplane coming in, but the transponder has been turned off. So we don't have any identification on the airplane. We know it's coming in fast. A representation of the FAA radar scope based on information obtained by 2020 shows the plane headed straight for what is known as P-56, prohibited airspace 56, which covers the White House and the Capitol at a speed of about 500 miles an hour with no radio contact whatsoever. 
it would be unprecedented for a commercial plane to come screaming through your airspace at that kind of speed, unidentified, without making some type of communication. This made it a perfect candidate for a shootdown, especially after two towers in New York had already been hit by an airplane. 5. The Secret Service had known about the incoming airplane for the last 30 minutes, so it's presumable they would have been ready to shoot it down if it became necessary. One of them approximately 30 minutes out, one of them approximately 45 minutes out. So we knew we had some, some time, but little time. Our supervisor picked up our line to the White House and started relaying to them the information. We have an unidentified, very fast-moving aircraft inbound toward your vicinity. Despite all this, no one moved a finger as the unknown threat kept rushing towards the Capitol. Someone came in and said to the vice president, uh, there's a plane out about 50 miles out. As the one nearest us got closer and closer, six minutes out, five minutes out. The same person said to the vice president, uh, Mr. Vice President, there's a plane 30 miles out. The Washington controllers came up on the speakerphone. They started counting down 10 miles from the White House. Young man said, Mr. Vice President, the plane's 10 miles out. Um, do the orders still stand? And the vice president sort of whipped his head around and said, of course they do. Nine miles from the White House. Eight miles from the White House. Seven miles west. And it went six, five, four. All the way down to one mile from the White House. But no missile was fired. Undisturbed, the plane turned around and went on to strike the Pentagon causing the death of at least 125 people between military and civilians on the ground. Question. The Secret Service knew about the incoming plane for the last 30 minutes, was following it on radar, had the means to shoot it down, and should have done so in order to protect the Capitol, but they didn't. Why? In regards to the exchange between Cheney and the young man, can you suggest anything different from an order not to shoot down the plane as it was approaching Washington's protected airspace?